Tom, to understand culture, cognitive science is front and center today. But you were there in the early days. You kind of helped create the use of cognitive science to understand culture. How did that happen? Why did it happen? What, what has been the developmental history? Wonder, wonderful questions, by the way, and a subject after my own heart. Uh, I think that the, the first story really is the inadequacy of behavioral psychology oh. to explain human behavior, including cultural behavior, including religion. Mm. You know, term, if you just stick at, with religion for a moment, Oh, that's just superstition. There's nothing interesting mm. from a scholar's point of view that we can study this scientifically, okay? But anyway, that was the kind of general attitude. And then uh, cognitive psychology, well, the cognitive revolution began to develop, which, by the way, it had its earlier roots in cybernetics and so forth. But the cognitive revolution began to say, look, there's much more than simply behavior. What's going on? I assure you, we have a brain. Mm -hmm. By the way, Skinner never talked about the brain. Mm -hmm. You know, all the variables were in the environment. Mm -hmm. That's all you needed is stuff outside there to explain what's going on uh, with your behavior. And uh, the cognitive revolution forces us to, first of all, take the concept of mind more seriously. But that meant really take the notion of capacities more seriously. Okay? Now, the sociologists and the uh, anthropologists didn't really help that much <laughs> because they also were emphasizing all the social conditions for, for, for behavior. But the, co the cognitive revolution began to say, wait, what about the capacities that humans have? For example, the capacity to acquire a language. Mm -hmm. We just took it for granted mm -hmm. that somehow the other people mm -hmm. learned a language. All of a sudden we discovered that between the ages of one and five, a child all has almost a complete grasp of a language already. Why is that the case? Well, because we have the capacity to acquire a language. The question was, do we have a capacity to acquire a religion? <laughs> and that was one of the questions that, uh, that I became very, very interested in, whether we have this capacity to acquire a religion. <laughs> but, we, but that is slightly off the subject, I want to, stick with cognition and culture. Mm -hmm. I think that culture itself is a, is a cognitive capacity. There, there's the notion of an evoked culture. Mm -hmm. That is to say, given a certain kind of condition in the real world, is there one form of culture that is more likely than another form, mm -hmm. you see? And so, uh, given certain kinds of capacities, what kinds of conditions will evoke this form rather mm. than, than that form? And there are all kinds of speculations mm. about what's going on there. Well, one challenge is that cognitive science deals by, by definition with individuals, with, with yes. isolated individuals. That's right, yes. And cultures are a collective. So right. some would claim that the collective really needs to be studied by other kinds of things, sociology or anthropology, and, and cognitive science uh, is, plays a part, but it's l less important. Yeah, the, uh, this is definitely uh, the standard uh, mm -hmm. objection mm -hmm. to cognitive psychology, but also cognitive anthropology. Mm. You see, there are, uh, there are anthropologists who are now saying you know, we have ignored human capacities and uh, we, can under we can explain these cultural forms precisely because humans have those kinds of capacities. Mm -hmm. So language is a very, very good example mm -hmm. of that. Language is a cultural form. Chinese is different from English, okay? So there are obviously different kinds of contexts that would you have to take very, very seriously, mm -hmm. the, the different way of making sounds and so forth. But, but the vocal apparatus, you know, has all of these sounds that it can make, and then they, in, in terms of evoke culture, certain of these sounds get pruned off mm. 
you know, on the basis of external <clears throat> stimuli, mm. okay? So you're looking at language acquisition as uh, again, Chomsky's uh, innate structure, deep yeah. structure, and, and things get pruned off from that to uh, enable specific languages to develop, as sure. opposed to just n nothing there and the whatever, yeah, they, whatever language yeah, just comes in. You, you know, it, uh, most people used to think, I presume, you know, that somehow that you learn the language by memorizing things. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But that, I, that's not the way it works at all. You know? yeah. and, but uh, the reason for this is because we have had the chance now to study the acquisition of language. Mm -hmm. what, what's amazing about the acquisition of language is that uh, if you take films over a three year period every day uh, of chi child development, you'll discover that this child is presented with degenerate information, you know. People are stopping, they're, they're talking, they're coughing, yeah. they're doing all kinds of things, and yet this kid is getting sufficient information in order to be able to speak very, very well. You've got to be able to explain why that is the case, because the information isn't in the environment only. There's some information in the environment, but there's something going on in, inside the capacity itself. And, 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 the, and when they resonate together, then you have sort of a very rapid go. acquisition. There you go. But you have to have that resonance. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So where are we today in terms of uh, cognition and culture? What are some of the current questions? Where do we go in the future? I, I think that the... Uh, that uh, the, the direction in which we're going now is more directly to the brain. <laughs> mm. I think that people are beginning to now, I think that the conversation uh, between, say, psychologists and anthropologists has been very productive. And that's why we have terms like cognitive uh, psychology and cognitive anthropology. But I think more and more we're going towards how does the brain fit into all of this stuff? That's one direction. The other direction is uh, much more attention being paid to the emotions. So yesterday I got a, in the mail a book called The Emotional Brain. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we, we begin, we're paying men, uh, more attention to the emotions on the one hand. A lot more research is going to go on that. And we're paying more attention to the uh, the other side. <laughs> well, if you look at the brain per, uh, per se, and that's obviously hot, it's very scientific. Yeah. Um, is, is there danger something could be lost because you're so focusing on the, the physical manifestations that you're losing some of the more complex aspects of mentality, which w would have great difficulty because of its complexity being reduced to the brain. I'm not saying there's anything magical there. No, but, no. Right. But, but you're, you're, by focusing on the brain, trying to be more scientific, more fundamental, you're, you're, you're going to be cutting off some critical information about mentality. Well, from my point of view, so all science is provisional. Uh, there's no such thing as a complete picture. Uh, we're always l learning more and we're studying more. So I think that there's always something being left out. Mm 